I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's book talk with Rebecca Donner, author of All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, published by Little Brown this month and already, very deservedly so, a bestseller. A Hebrew translation of the book is forthcoming from Matar Publishing in Israel, and it's already out in the UK as well. Rebecca is a novelist by trade, writing two books before this, Sunset Terrace and Burnout, and numerous essays and reports and publications, including the New York Times. Rebecca is a member of the National Books Critics Circle and has taught writing at Wesleyan and Columbia Universities and Barnard College. All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days is a very different kind of book than she's written before, and we're quite excited to be hosting her today to discuss it. You can order a signed copy of the book from Community Bookstore in Brooklyn at the link in the Zoom chat. We'll begin our discussion in a moment. Please feel free to share questions using the Zoom Q&A box anytime during the discussion, and we'll get to as many as we can. Rebecca, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Ari. It's such a pleasure. So I wanted to invite you to begin today's discussion with a brief reading from the book, and then we'll go from there. OK, certainly. Um, this is the book. And um, I think that the best place to start is just the introduction, because it provides readers a, a good sense of what is to come. Um, so I'll just begin. Introduction. Her aim was self-erasure. The more invisible she was, the better her chances of survival. In her journal, she noted what she ate, read, thought. The first was uncontroversial. The second and third were not. For this reason, she hid the journal. When she suspected the Gestapo was closing in on her, she destroyed it, burned it, most likely. She was at the harrowing center of the German resistance, but she wasn't German, nor was she Polish or French. She was American, conspicuously so. The men she recruited acquired code names, armless, beamer, worker. She operated under no code name. Still, she was elusive. The nature of her work required absolute secrecy. She didn't dare tell her family who were scattered across the towns and dairy farms of the, of the Midwest. They remained bewildered that she, at 26, had jumped aboard a steamer ship and crossed the Atlantic, leaving behind everyone she loved. Her family is my family. Three generations separate us. She preferred anonymity, so I will whisper her name, Mildred Harnock. In 1932, she held her first clandestine meeting in her apartment, a small band of political activists that grew into the largest underground resistance group in Berlin by the end of the decade. During the Second World War, her group collaborated with a Soviet espionage network that conspired to defeat Hitler employing agents and operatives in Paris, Geneva, Brussels, and Berlin. In the fall of 1942, the Gestapo pounced. She was thrown in prison. So were her cold conspirators. During a hastily convened trial at the Reichskriegsgericht, the Reich court martial, a prosecutor who'd earned the moniker Hitler's bloodhound hammered them with questions. She sat on a wooden chair in the back of a courtroom. Other chairs held high-ranking Nazi officials. At the center of the room sat a panel of five judges. Everyone there was German except her. When it was her turn, she approached the stand. She was emaciated, her lungs ravaged by tuberculosis she contract contracted in prison. How long she stood there remains unknown. Surviving documents don't note the time the prosecutor began questioning her or the time he stopped. What is known is this. The answers she gave him were lies, real whoppers. The judges believed her. The sentence she received was considered mild, six years of hard labor in a prison camp. Two days later, Hitler overrode the verdict and ordered her execution. On February 16, 1943, she was strapped to a guillotine and beheaded. After the war, the US Army's Counterintelligence Corps opened an investigation. 
Mildred Harnock's actions are laudable, one CIC official observed in 1946, noting the rather extensive file they had on her. It is quite possible that investigation will disclose the commission of a war crime, wrote one other. Their higher ranking colleague later reprimanded them in a terse memo. This case is classified as R, secret, restricted, and should not have been referred for investigation. Withdraw a case from detachment D and do not continue the investigation. So the CIC buried her case. The reason for this would not come to light for 50 years. Still news leaked out. On December 1, 1947, the New York Times ran a story under the headline, Hitler beheaded American woman as a personal reprisal in 1943. With comprehensive knowledge of the German underground movement, Mildred Harnock stood up courageously under Gestapo torture and revealed nothing, it noted. Later that week, the Washington Post praised her as one of the leaders in the underground against the Nazis. Readers of the New York Times and the Washington Post were probably surprised to learn that an active underground resistance in Germany had even existed. A central problem for anyone who wanted to write about her group was a lack of documentary evidence. It wasn't until 1989, when the Berlin Wall came crashing down, that a trove of documents stashed in an East German archive came to light. Several years later, Russia permitted historians a peek at foreign intelligence files. And in 1998, under the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act, the CIA, FBI, and US Army began to release records once classified as top secret, a process that continues to this day. We now have a more nuanced understanding of the underground resistance in Germany, but factual inaccuracy persists. Details about Mildred Harnock are scant and frequently incorrect. The ashes of the journal she kept can't serve as a corrective. Despite her wish to remain invisible, she left a trail for us to follow. Along the trail are official documents, British, US, and Soviet era intelligence files thick as your wrist. Then there are the unofficial documents, which reveal deeper truths. The letters she wrote, the letters other people wrote to her and about her. Families and friend members, pardon me, family and friends left behind notes, date books, diaries, photographs, testimonials. It can't be said that there was a consensus about the woman they knew or thought they knew. To many, she was an enigma, inspiring a range of contradictory conclusions about who she was and why she did what she did. Nearly all the people who knew her are lost to history. Those who are still alive are well into their 90s, one I hope to find more than any other. He was just a boy when he met Mildred, young enough to be her son. I tracked him down and implored him. What did she tell you? How did she enter a room? Did you hear her weep, sing? Did she trust you? What a perfect introduction to the book, which is a long book, but has so much happening in it and you hint at a lot of the, the storylines in the introduction. I want to begin by asking you, picking up on where you finish off that reading and asking you a little bit about the process and then we'll get into the story itself. But this isn't just a scholarly work about Mildred Harnock, it's also a quest to tell part of your own family's story because she was your great, great aunt. Um, so, so, I'll, so I'll start with this. You, you mentioned in the introdu introduction that you wanted to track down a young boy who had known Mildred and was one of the last sources about her. Uh, yeah. By the time you began your research, he was not a boy anymore, but a, an 89 year old man in California named Don Heath. What brought you to Don as part of your research? Well, yes, my, my grandmother told me about Don um, when I was a teenager and I, I uh, his name sort of stayed in my memory for, for many years. Um, Don Heath was 11 when he became Mildred's courier in Berlin. And I uh, had been intending to write this book 
really since I was a teenager. And when my grandmother gave me Mildred's letters and said, you must write this book one day, she knew that I wanted to be a writer, that I wanted to write great books. And she felt that this book was a worthy one um, to write. Uh, when I began writing the manuscript in earnest, um, I assumed that I had missed my chance to interview Don Heath. Um, and then I found out quite accidentally uh, that he indeed was alive. Uh, I was at an artist residency in upstate New York and, and, and I immediately got on the phone and called him and he answered and I interviewed him. Uh, I couldn't quite believe that I was listening to his voice. Um, and then I jumped on a plane and flew out to Northern California where he lived with his wife. Um, and I interviewed him for days and, um, and he told me in great detail about how twice a week between 1940, 39 and 1941, um, he would visit Mildred's apartment ostensibly for tutoring sessions. And at the end of a session, Mildred would slip a note into his knapsack, uh, which he would then pass on to his father, who was a diplomat at the US Embassy in Berlin, uh, who had a confidential arrangement with Secretary of Treasury Henry Morgenthau Jr., Assistant Secretary of State George Messersmith, and Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells to obtain intelligence from key uh, sources in Berlin. And um, after Don passed away, uh, shortly after our interview, the Heath family gave me exclusive access to 12 steamer trunks of documents um, that were filled with letters and date books and diaries. And it was such a treasure. And in it, uh, I discovered his mother, Louise Heath's diaries. And, and those in particular were valuable to me because I was able to corroborate a lot of what he said um, and sort of connect the dots. So that's when, um, to speak of process, this is when I decided, you know, first of all, the, the, the book blew wide, wide open for me. I, I interviewed who may have been the last person alive who had uh, witnessed Mildred's acts of espionage um, on behalf of the United States and, and had also participated in them. And so I realized that I needed to devote a lot more space to him and to his family um, in the book. And so I did structure the book um, as kind of two parallel narrative lines. There's Mildred's line and then there's Don Keith's line. He becomes a really important secondary character, but there are so many interesting secondary characters. I mean, it's, it's a biography of Mildred Harnock that is also sort of a profile of this Amer American world that she inhabited in Berlin. Yes, definitely. I, I am. Well, there he is. There's Don Heath. <laughs> I love that's, a, that's about the age um, when he started working as her courier. And so, as I say, in a, uh, and there I am with him. Uh, at He's 89. Uh, we had just finished our final interview. And um, and after that picture was taken, he actually looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, now I can die, Rebecca. Um, it was incredibly dramatic. And, um, and I said, you know, don't do that. Um, but then, as I said, about a month later, he did die. Um, and I think that, you know, he had spoken about his story um, in, in various, um, uh, two various interviewers, including, um, Mildred Harnock's first biographer, Shireen Brysak, but he did not go into great detail. He held back a lot. Um, because I'm related to Mildred, he said I'm like family to him. He called her Aunt Mildred um, when he spoke to me. And, and, um, and I think he was ready to tell more of the story. Um, and so, and again, in, in those steamer trunks, not only did I discover his uh, mother's diaries and date books, but also some um, unpublished memoirs, both written by him and also by his father, Don Heath Sr. They really make the story come alive in the book. So, so Mildred Harnock was, or Fish Harnock, which she's referred to in some, in some places, yeah. was a blonde, blue-eyed American woman born to a Christian family in Wisconsin. And she moved to Germany for love in, I believe, 1929. Uh, yes, so that's right, in 1929. German husband, Arvid Harnock. What for love and also to pursue, a P to pursue a PhD. She had professional um, ambitions as well. And there was a PhD program she wanted to enroll in. Yes, um, they, they, and their image was, or their, their, their notion of the future was they would become academics. He was finishing his PhD as well. And they would lecture in German universities and also in uh, American universities. And they would go back and forth across the Atlantic. 
So what kind of life did they build in those first years before the Nazis rose to power in Germany? She was teaching and studying at the same time and uh, in a relatively intellectually open environment under the Weimar uh, regime. Yes, yes. Um, yes, so those first few years, she, she enrolled in a PhD program at the University of Gießen and um, they were actually separated for uh, uh, for stretches of months at a time because he was working on his PhD, um, and um, and 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 so and 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 she would lecture and at, at the University of Berlin um, when then he was studying for um, a, a certification and so basically. Um, uh, but they wrote letters to each other and and they met um, also on weekends and um, and. Uh, read books to each other and um, and and really uh, planned for the future. I think during this time, Mildred uh, was appalled at the uh, rise in popularity of, of the Nazi party. Um, and uh, she really, and it's really important to understand that in 1928, a year before she arrived, the Nazi party received less than 3% of the vote in the Reichstag election, um, the German parliament. Just two years later in 1930, the Nazi party received 18%. And then in 1932, 37%. And for the first time, the Nazi party was um, a majority, um, uh, the largest party, I should say, in the Reichstag. Um, and, and, and there were many other political parties at that time, all uh, sort of covering the whole spectrum from left to right. Um, Mildred saw at the University of Gießen swastikas everywhere. 50% uh, of the students were members of a Nazi fraternity. and she. You know, this was around the time where she and Arvid started talking about what they could do to resist. So a year before Hitler was chancellor, um, she began holding her first meetings in their Berlin apartment. Um, and both of them would invite friends and friends of friends. Um, and she would invite her students. Actually, the University of Berlin was her was a pool of recruits, potential recruits for her. And um, and so she would invite whom she thought were like-minded people, people who opposed the Nazi party um, and wanted to discuss what to do about it to the apartment. It was a small scrappy group, um, a diverse group, uh, men and women. Um, there were Jews in the group, there were Catholics, there were atheists, um, there were factory workers and um, as I said, students and professors and um, people who were unemployed as well. Um, and, uh, and they were, Social Democrats and, and communists, they, they, and they tended to be uh, um, to representing the left side of this political spectrum. But there was no centralized um, ideology that governed this group, uh, except they were unified in their opposition to the Nazi party and to Hitler, who was also uh, with the rise in popularity of, of the Nazi party, of course, as he was at its head. Uh, and, um, and his popularity was, there was just a meteoric rise uh, very quickly. Um, and, uh, and then um, uh, she continued to recruit Germans into the resistance after Hitler became chancellor, it was just a lot more difficult and dangerous. So I wanna ask you about that in more detail, but before I do, Mildred was really at the center of the American social world in Berlin. You write that uh, she was well-connected to diplomats and businessmen, and you write in the book that she knew virtually every American living in Berlin at the time, uh, including the daughter of the American ambassador who is discussed in the book at length, Martha Dodd. Can you paint a picture of the American community in Berlin for us? and? My understanding is that Mildred was pretty unique in the ways she responded to the rise of Nazism. How did others in her American community respond? Well, yes, I, I, um, as you alluded to earlier, Ari, I do I include a lot of people in this book. It's it's populated by these of us the full spectrum of people in, in Berlin at that time. And, and I do spend a lot of time, not only on the, 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 the Nazi officials um, uh, who were in power and um, all of, all of uh, Hitler's lackeys and their participation um, in oppressing um, uh, the people who lived in Germany um, and, 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 and also uh, uh, as, the, as, the, as the regime continued and into the Second World War, I also covered those years um, and, and what occurred as well. Uh, but in the early years, and I should also mention, I, I structure my book chronologically because I really want people to see in real time how quickly Germany progressed from a parliamentary democracy 
during the Weimar era uh, to a fascist dictatorship. It really did happen in the blink of an eye um, after Hitler became chancellor in 1933. And so we move uh, in chapters through, um, uh, through the years. And, and so um, I, I, in, the, in the mid thirties, I, I talk about how, uh, what was going on in Germany, um, how uh, anti-Semitism um, was, was uh, you know, adopted as a, as, as a policy, as a governmental policy, um, and how, uh, you know, beginning in, in, on April 1st, uh, 1933, um, when the persecution of, of Jews began with the national boycott of all Jewish businesses and, and then just continued from there. Uh, and, and also all of the Germans who did, um, uh, there's a word for it, who, who were, uh, could be characterized as midlaufe, um, which is one who follows along due to opportunism or cowardice. And a lot of people closed their eyes uh, to what was going on as we very well know. Um, uh, and, and also, uh, I focus on the Americans in Berlin and the American, dip, uh, basically the diplomats who were there and um, the barely concealed anti-Semitism that, that was prevalent among a lot of, of the diplomats at that time. And I go into the archives and I quote from letters and, um, and, and I also talk about the, uh, the ambassador um, at the time, um, Dodd and his and his daughter um, and um, Martha Dodd, who became a friend of, of Mildred's, and there was a way in which the Americans kind of could turn a blind eye. The American expats in Berlin could turn a blind eye to the atrocities around them, or many of them did, and they continued in a in a kind of a of a protected bu bubble, um, and. Uh, I think um, you know Mildred met a lot of them at the American Women's Club, where she lectured frequently on American literature, and um, and then she soon became president of the American Women's Club, and the 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 members of the American Women Club Women's Club tended to be uh, wives um, of of diplomats and um, and uh, sort of people in the upper echelons of society who again sort of moved in these rarefied circles. And, um, and so and Mildred became quite uh, well known. And in fact, there's a, there's a document that, that, that turns up in, in um, a, a US intelligence files uh, where Mildred is described um, as one of the most um, um, sort of uh, conspicuous and popular uh, American women in, in Berlin at the time. She just knew everybody. And she used that to her advantage uh, as she got deeper and deeper into the resistance, um, her acts of resistance and her involvement in the resistance. And so by 1935, um, she and Arvid Harnock decided that, uh, that they would try to seek assistance from countries outside of Germany. Um, they wanted to connect with the resistance um, in, um, in other places so that they could receive assistance as well because it was quite difficult to function in a fascist dictatorship. Leaflets really paper were their only weapon against um, the Nazi regime at that point. Uh, they distributed uh, paper, again, um, these were illegal. Uh, the, the, the leaflets would basically urge Germans to resist and called for revolution. But if they were caught with one of these leaflets, um, the punishment was a year in a concentration camp. And so actually two of her recruits were arrested and hauled off to a concentration camp. Um, and then they turned around afterwards, came back and continued their work in the resistance. But this was, uh, you know, um, there was a high attrition rate for this reason. And so, so she used her sort of getting back to her connection to the US embassy. She used that, um, her, connections there to um, help Jews escape, uh, to uh, uh, help uh, people obtain visas. Um, she also, because she had an American passport, she could travel to other countries and meet with contacts in the resistance much more freely than those who were um, the Germans who were in her group. She did all of this at great personal risk. She could have left any time. I mean, up, in, up until a certain point, she could have left with relative ease. Uh, because she was American, but she chose to stay and to 
put her life on the line in order to, uh, you know, for the future of a country that, that wasn't her own. Why do you think she stayed? Well, that's such a great question. And it's one that I, that I really sat with for quite a while when I was writing this book. Um, you know, she, does, she did visit the United States um, once in 1937. She visited her family. Her mother was dying. Um, and she uh, decided that probably this would be the last time she could see her. And every single one of her family members urged her to stay. Um, don't go back to Germany. And, and they said to her, and they actually thought that she had lost her mind. Her brother thought that she had lost her mind because at that point, Mildred was quite paranoid. She thought that she was under surveillance. And in Germany, she was, she had a, a very, it, it was a, a realistic concern that the Gestapo would have kept their, you know, eye on her um, and members of, of the group. And in fact, the, there was a Gestapo raid of their apartment in 1940. So, um, so she knew that, that she had to be exceedingly careful. And, but here she was in the United States um, and, and, and she couldn't tell her family that she was in the resistance. She just said, I need to go back. Um, and she couldn't, she, couldn't, uh, she, she couldn't be frank with them. Um, and so, uh, and, and there was something brittle in her demeanor and, um, and, and her withholding. And quite ironically, several members of her family thought that she had quote, gone Nazi. Um, little did they know um, that, that Nazis were who she was fighting. But, um, she did go back, and in 1939, Arvid uh, bought a, a one-way ticket for her to, to return, you know, by steamership to the United States. He was so concerned that she would, um, that her life was in peril, and, and that ticket was in her purse when she was arrested by the Gestapo, and I, in the archives, I found the uh, questionnaire that was given to her at Klutensee Prison in Berlin, which is where she was executed. And she um, uh, had to fill this out um, and um, shortly before she was executed. And I, and I feature it in, throughout the book. I don't know if you can see, but right there is, is, a, little, is a little snippet of it. And, and I, throughout the book, I have these fragments um, where I, I show the readers um, bits of this questionnaire, um, little bits at a time. And, and so in, in this questionnaire, is, you see uh, one of the questions is what are your belongings um, and, um, and, and what do you have with you right now? And also what do you own? Where is your apartment? What valuables do you have? And of course, all of these things were confiscated. Um, but she says um, here um, at the top, uh, uh, her answer is one ship ticket, United States lines. Um, and then she goes on to describe her apartment furnishings um, and other possessions. And so, um, yeah, she ignored her own husband's um, um, plea for her to leave. I think she felt, and you know, we are just left to speculate. Her, she burned her diary. She did not write about this choice in her in her letters uh, back home. She knew that. Um, that they were censored. Um, and so, I, you know, Nazi censors were reading all the mail. And so she uh, often wrote in code, um, but, you know, so, so I, I'm very careful in this book. I never um, state what she felt unless I know that there is a primary source document, a letter, um, a post-war testimony, a diary entry, something that tells me um, that, that clearly this is the case. So I can only conjecture, but I think she felt like it was important. Um, you know, this is this was not her home country, but she felt that she um, uh, very much felt that there was a great injustice being done. And she believed in, and in her early letters, she talks about how important it is to resist. Um, and we must do something about, as she wrote to her mother, we must do something about this as soon as possible. So she felt this tremendous urgency. Um, and, uh, and, and this gave her life purpose, clearly. I'm just gonna put up while we're talking about Mildred, a couple photos of her. Can I just, I'm sorry, I just, now that you have something on the screen, I just realized I'm just about to run out of, my battery power is, is running out. I'm just gonna run and get an adapter um, and then I'll be back in about really one minute. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize I didn't have one in here. I'm glad you noticed, no problem. <laughs>
<laughs> Me too. Uh, so, so everybody, uh, you can look at these um, images, and that's a Gestapo mugshot. And I can speak up more about this in just one second. All right. Thank you, Becca. Well, while she's gone, I'm just going to share a couple of the. I mean, if you've read the book, the, the stunning details to illustrate the the scope of the resistance work that was happening and how it ultimately involved Mildred and her her husband were. So, um, Arvid, her husband, was. Uh, became a Soviet spy and was sharing information with the Soviets that he gleaned from his senior role in the German Ministry of Economics. Um, Mildred was sharing information with the US government. They both were distributing leaflets, as Rebecca mentioned. Um, she also was uh, helping to publish an underground newspaper. Ar Arvid's intelligence to the Soviet Union was the key, he was the key source that notified Stalin that Germany was planning to invade the Soviet Union in 1941. Um, uh, several of their close friends and acquaintances, including Arvid's cousins, uh, came together with the plan to assassinate Hitler in 1938. So when we talk about resistance and um, th the fact that they evaded capture, I, I, I think it's all the more impressive given some of those facts. Rebecca, are you plugged in? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I just sprinted down the stairs and sprinted back um, and, and discovered that the actually the the adapter was right here. So um, I'm just going to take a sip of water and then we can proceed. Sure. So I, I mean, I just was sharing some of the amazing facts about Mildred and Arvid's espionage. And, and it's also important to note that while they were doing all of this, they were publicly presenting themselves as a Nazi, a dutiful Nazi couple. He oh, yeah. a Nazi with his American wife. Um, he at, at one point decided to actually join the Nazi party in order to keep up his cover, which he'd resisted doing. And a detail that I found absolutely fascinating was that Mildred decided to join the Daughters of the American Revolution at the same time as Arvid joined the Nazi party um, because she thought the DAR would give her sort of Nazi credentials as an American. Right. German. Yes, she did. She she was living a double life at that time and so was, was Arvid. Uh, they really did present themselves as this, um, I, well, he got a job at the Ministry of Economics and rose through the ranks um, and he got this job with the express purpose of gaining access to top secret documents about Hitler's operational and later military strategies, which then he passed on to the Soviet Union and then also to the United States. Um, and, and Mildred assisted in this as, as well. Um, I, um, and, and so, and another member of their, several members of the group actually, uh, Followed the same strategy. They um, got jobs in the ministries, and um, so Karl Schulze Boysen um, got a, a position at the Luftwaffe, and so he had access to all of the missions, you know, during World War II. And then uh, he passed this information on um, to Hitler's enemies and um, very specific uh, military strategies. And in fact, both Arvid and Karl Schulze Boysen, because they were so effective at um, uh, convincing those around them that they were loyal Nazis, um, they were able to obtain um, uh, a, an abundance of information about um, Hitler's uh, plan to invade the Soviet Union. And so they, uh, one of some of the documents that I uncovered in a, in a Russian archive, um, Soviet era intelligence documents, um, I found the, the memos that um, were kept at Moscow center with all of their intelligence, the date, the intelligence they passed, um, their names, their code names. And um, there is a document in my book. I also make sure, ah, I just opened up to the page. This is, this is the document there. Um, and, um, and I make sure throughout the book to, to feature photographs uh, to really bring the history you know, um, to vivid life. Um, but when, when presented with, this, with, this, with these um, memos, was really, and it was compiled in a report, Stalin refused to believe that at that time, uh, Hitler, who um, he had, uh, of course, had a pact with um, at that time, could refuse to believe that he would ever invade him. And so um, uh, he uh, scrawled an obscenity across the report, which I also include in my book. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, then, and then just a few days later, um, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. So, so Har, uh, Harald Schulze-Boysen and Arvid Harnock attempted to warn um, Stalin and, and he refused to listen. But again, going back to your question, I mean, they were so effective um, 
at getting these documents um, uh, because they were able to uh, convince everybody that they believed um, that they they did they shared the the beliefs of, of those Nazi officials around them. Mildred had to play the part of this loyal uh, Nazi wife, and so yes, she she joined the DAR. Um, she she um, would also when she would recruit Germans into the resistance. She at that point in the mid 30s to late 30s, she became exceedingly careful because she knew that if she were caught and turned into the Gestapo, um, you know, it would be very easy for her to be arrested and uh, thrown in prison. And so she adopted a strategy, and we know this from a post-war testimony from one of the survivors. She would pretend, she would present somebody with a book and pretend that, um, that, that she supported Hitler and, and ask this person, what do you think of this book? And, and the book would be uh, something that, is, uh, that was antithetical to um, Nazi beliefs. And then depending on what their reaction would be, she would sort of assess whether or not there might be some receptivity and then she would, um, to joining the resistance and then she would slowly initiate conversations. And sometimes this led to tremendous misunderstandings. And in my book, I talk about one occasion when the, um, the writer, Rebecca West, um, Mildred paid a visit to her in London and attempted this. Um, and, and Rebecca West threw her out of the apartment, she said, and she was so disgusted and she thought, how could you ever support this um, this regime? I uh, and um, and and then later she wrote to the head of the CIA and recounted the whole episode. And um, by that point, Mildred had been um, executed, and and Rebecca West regretted that she had misunderstood that she, that Mildred was actually attempting clumsily to um, to see whether she could recruit her into the resistance. Well. Uh in many ways, Mildred's resistance work and her husband Arvid's resistance work were totally linked. And also in other ways, they were pursuing independent resistance activities at the same time. But a lot of the, the post-war focus has uh, sort of downplayed her role and focused on Arvid's work. Can you- Yes, indeed. Explore? Yes, well, I think, you know, it's important. The historians typically name Arvid Harnoff as a leader and either ignore Mildred entirely or mention her merely as, as Arvid's wife. Um, Mildred's recruits uh, are transformed into Arvid's recruits. Um, and I didn't really speak about this that much, but she also recruited after she was fired from the University of Berlin in part because of her political viewpoints and her, she was very candid in her opposition um, to the Nazi party and, and the administration didn't look too kindly on this. She got a job, um, and this is in 1932 again, so this is before Hitler became chancellor. Um, but uh, uh, she then got a job at, at an adult night school um, in Berlin, and it was the first of its kind, and it was basically a lot of unemployed um, and blue-collar uh, blue workers um, um, and un unemployed Germans uh, were the students there, and they were given hot meals and um, uh, books and, um, and after they worked their factory jobs, they would come and sit down and, and take classes. And Mildred found that this group of, of Germans were among her most loyal recruits. Um, and this was a group that was being targeted relentlessly by the Nazi party with propaganda. Um, but several, several, I, I'm certainly, I, I, she had to be very careful who she would recruit, but there were a couple of students in that group who actually went on and, and got code names. I mentioned a couple of the code names in the introduction armless beamer worker, those among them were um, people who were her former students, but, but historians uh, call the, them Arvid's recruits. Um, and, 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 you know, Arvid is presenting, is presiding over the meetings with Mildred as a kind of silent partner, but in fact, archival evidence establishes that at the beginning of 1935, she led most of the meetings. Um, and this was around the time that, Mildred, um, that Arvid got the job at the Ministry of Economics. So these are, these are errors that have calcified over time into so-called facts. And, and even in 1947, when the New York Times ran that story that I also mentioned in the introduction um, about Mildred, uh, it's, it's riddled with, riddled with factual errors. I mean, I counted at least eight of them. And, and most consequential is that Arvid is called an underground leader and Mildred is dismissed as his wife. Um, 
you know, the, the, uh, the prominent um, and eminent British historian Richard Evans wrote that women played, and I'm, I'm quoting right now, women played a particularly prominent role in the underground resistance in Germany, particularly, he says, Harnock's American wife, Mildred Harnock. Um, and then he goes on and changes the subject and talks about the men again. So it's it never really explained what her prominent role was. Um, she was just passed over. And as recently as, as just last year, um, the best-selling German writer, Norman Oller, uh, in, in his book about this group um, trivializes Mildred's central role and confuses the manner of her death as well, uh, describing her as climbing up a scaffold to be hanged um, instead of led to a guillotine. And, and you know, these are, uh, these, these details are important. Um, the, the women in the group were um, primarily uh, the instrument of their execution was a guillotine, the men were either hanged or shot. Um, and it was a, the Nazi special perversity to view uh, beheading as more humane than hanging. Um, um, but the women were also, Mildred and, and the others in her group were also subjected to dissection after they were executed. And, and I also, a, a very grim chapter toward the end of my book, I described um, a, a professor, the head of um, the, um, anatomy department at the University of Berlin. Uh, his name is Hermann Stieva. Uh, he had a special arrangement with the director at Clinton State Prison to transport the women's bodies um, to his laboratory immediately after their beheading so that he could um, investigate the effects of acute stress on their reproductive organs. Um, this, this all uh, came to light just recently and in, 19, um, in uh, 2019, yeah, you can see a, a story in the New York Times about um, basically the microscopic remains of these women were discovered and, and given a proper burial. Uh, the Guardian also published an article about this. It's a oft repeated pattern in history that, that important women are left out or relegated to the, the title of housewife, but sometimes those, those stories never get unearthed because the primary source material isn't there or because there isn't a really enterprising historian who's gonna go unearth it. So it's sort of a heroic act that you've lifted her to the center of our conversations about resistance in Berlin. Oh yeah, I, I, um, I think um, this was one of my um, sort of aims in writing this book was to not only to tell the aspects of Mildred's story that haven't been told before, um, or, uh, but also uh, the stories of others in her group. Um, and, and I did focus on um, women in her group and I did uh, basically this, be, this began for me when I, when I was at this um, archive in Berlin at the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand, which is the German Resistance Memorial Center. And, um, and I, there I discovered, um, it was really one of my most significant archival discoveries were the notes that were passed in prison between um, the women in this group. Um, and, um, you know, they, they were charged with treason and awaiting trial, um, and, and the men were too. The men were uh, basically get locked up in men's prisons and the women were in, locked up in women's prisons after they were processed um, by the Gestapo at, at Gestapo headquarters. And um, I should also just very quickly before I move on, I can show both of these. So the, in my book, in the photo insert, I show the photographs of, of members of this group. These are the Gestapo headshots, um, the, the mug shots um, that were taken after they were arrested. Um, this is in 1942. Um, and that's Mildred right there. Um, I, and you showed that when I was running and getting my, my um, club, right? So, um, uh, and you can see, um, anyway, other members of the group, I, this is just, I just devote two pages to it, but there were, there were um, many more. Um, after they were processed at the Gestapo headquarters, the women were sent to women's prisons, the men were sent to men's prisons and they awaited a, a mass treason trial. Um, and, and so the, they would, in order, they were forbidden to communicate with one another, but um, they did pass these notes um, that they were called Kassiba. And, uh, and, and I found these um, at, at, this, um, at this Berlin archive. And, and so they would slip them to this was they would slip them to each other during their daily walk in the prison yard, and sometimes they would um, sew them into the hems of their uh, garments or 
um, in the brick or in the cracks of the fissures of the walls in the prison for other prisoners to find. Um, and uh, they were strictly prohibited and, and the guards were given a reward um, for finding them. Um, so, uh, uh, so it was quite rare to find at, at an archive that would still save some of these. And um, basically um, some of them were quite poetic. They were almost like um, little poems, um, impressions of what the light looked like. Um, and um, some of them described the work that they would do all day long. Um, um, you, they, they were engaged in, in forced labor. Um, and, and some of them were just filled with gossip. Anyway, I found one uh, that mentioned Mildred um, and mentioned one of the members of the group uh, who had betrayed her to um, the Gestapo interrogators. So this was really, uh, this, this then, when I found these and then I was able to sort of trace who was who, uh, then that gave me an idea of which members, uh, which women in the group to focus on. And then I sort of traced, traced backwards to, um, I decided to sort of begin with their acts of resistance. And these were women who did everything that the men did. Um, and they participated in producing the leaflets, distributing the leaflets. Um, some of them participated in acts of espionage um, and plotting sabotage. Um, and, and, uh, and, and then I document their arrest and then um, follow them through prison and, and, and so on. Um, so, so I think, you know, I think it's also important to understand that there are gaps in the record. Um, the, the Nazis burned uh, and destroyed, there are two different accounts to what, about what happened to the uh, trial transcripts, but they were destroyed. Um, and, and so all that exists um, is the sentencing document. So uh, this is just one example of um, the, the gaps in the record that, that um, exist. And so, uh, and, and one of the ways in which it's been difficult to tell this story. Um, so I definitely in my story note where we have those gaps, um, uh, both in the narrative and also in my end notes, because I think that that's an important part of the record too, not only to discuss um, what, what we know about these people whose stories have remained un Told, but also uh, what we don't know. And what we don't know tells us about the people who participated in destroying that evidence and their knowledge of culpability. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm gonna to turn to some of the, the audience questions now. There's a bunch of questions about what happened to Mildred and her husband at the end of the war. That's, <laughs> it takes a couple oh. hundred pages. So I, as briefly as you can, um, can yeah. you walk through the trial and the execution? Sure. So, um, so, uh, in the fall of, of 1942, Harold Schultz-Boyson, I mentioned him earlier, he, he uh, was a lieutenant um, um, in the Luftwaffe, stealing information, giving it to the Soviet Union, he was arrested. And his wife, Libertas, had warned as many people as possible, hide yourselves, you know, um, they found us. Um, there's, a long, there's a long involved story about radio transmitters and, and, and uh, messages that are intercepted by um, members of of the uh, German intelligence, and we don't have time for that, so I urge you all to read my book. And um, and it's it's also uh, it's one of the aspects of this group that is pretty well known, um, th and that's the spy thriller aspect of, of the book. Um, uh, the, the the messages that were intercepted and and um, and then eventually just decoded, and then everybody's attempt to flee and avoid um, Gestapo capture. Mildred and Arvid. Uh, uh, fled to Nazi-occupied Lithuania, and uh, they were planning to, by all accounts, um, escape to Sweden. And um, the next morning after their arrival, the Gestapo arrived. Um, they drove 500 miles to track them down. An SS officer named Horst Koko was, was uh, uh, basically took it upon himself to personally arrest Mildred and Arvid. Um, and so then they were taken to Gestapo headquarters and I showed you the mug shots and they, uh, Mildred spent three and a half um, months in solitary confinement. She as an American was actually treated more harshly than the others in the group. Um, she was not permitted to write letters um, uh, and uh, uh, read books um, at that time. Arvid was given some of these privileges. He actually started writing a new book, um, but, and he was even allowed to, uh, receive a, a visit from his brother, Fall Karnak, um, and um, at least twice, uh, Mildred was not permitted any visitors. 
Um, and then there was one trial, uh, the first trial, um, Mildred was given, as in this, I read in the beginning of the book, but she was given six months in, uh, pardon me, six years in a um, prison camp, um, six years of hard labor. And then, and Arvid was sentenced to hang. So right before he, um, his execution, he wrote a letter to Mildred. Um, and that letter is in my book as well. Mildred gave it to her cellmate, Gertrude Klapoth, um, who was then transferred to Ravensbrück concentration camp and miraculously survived and held on to the letter. And this is the reason we have it to this. Rebecca, I think you're frozen right now. Um, hopefully you'll come back in just a moment. I don't know if you can hear me. We cannot hear you. Uh, if you can hear us, I would suggest just logging out of Zoom and, and logging right back in and um, hopefully you'll be with us for the last 10 minutes or so. Rebecca, now we, we can see you again, but you just need to unmute. Rebecca, you're just muted right now. Can you hear me? I'm back. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Welcome back. So I think, um, uh, I don't know where I got cut off, but basically I was just getting to the end of the point, which was um, Arvid um, wrote a letter um, that survived. And uh, two days after Mildred's sentence, um, Hitler reversed the, the sentence and ordered her execution. There's a beautiful question from an audience member named Carrie who says, Rebecca, why do you think so few individuals stood up and participated in the resistance. Did you identify a common trait that people like Mildred shared, enabling them to resist despite the fear, oppression, and threats of death? Yeah, I, of course, I've given so much thought to that, a common trait. I mean, I, I think about, I think about um, how important it is to recognize that, you know, these are real stories of courage and sacrifice. Um, and in the name of uh, as a resistance. And I think about every morning Mildred and her co-conspirators waking up and what must have been in their minds. I, they didn't know whether they would live or die that day. They were very well aware of the, of the risks that they were taking. But unlike so many, they were willing to take the risk and without knowing what the outcome would be. Some and I, I think they, they had the courage of their convictions. They, they, um, they simply could not wake up and, and get through the day uh, uh, without taking a moral stance against um, the atrocities around them. There's two wonderful questions here from an audience member named Sheldon. Um, so I'll, I'll ask them both at once. First, have you been able to discover new insights about Mildred since your book went to press? Have someone, anyone come forward and, and gotten in touch with you? Oh, I'm not sure if hopefully she'll be back with us in just a moment, but it's a great question, Sheldon. Hi again. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't know where I, I got cut off, but um, I think we do need a history lesson right now. And I think we need um, to take uh, inspiration from the stories of these people who did risk and lose their lives in fighting um, a fascist dictator. God knows there is a lot of injustice, hate, authoritarianism in our world today. So these lessons are timely. Yes. There's two questions I wanna ask you here from an audience member named Sheldon. Uh, have you been able to discover new insights about Mildred since your book went to press? And also what is your next project? Uh, I, I, I discover new, I feel like I discover new things every day. I mean, I could have kept, I, I really, I would have kept writing this book for the next 20 years if, if I, if I, um, if I wanted to, I mean, I, and I just decided I needed to get the book out now. Um, but uh, because I have her letters and I've, I've poured over them, every time I look at them again, I find something new and I've, I've, I've read them hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, but in, in terms of uh, what's in the historical record, you know, I submitted Freedom of Information Act requests for FOIA requests um, to, um, uh, to try to declassify some of the intelligence documents um, on Mildred. And most of them have, have been declassified. Um, 
Some of them have not. I, I succeeded. I had to submit um, um, uh, several letters about one particular document, and, and finally they did declassify um, this document. And um, and 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 the, the story got uh, sort of broader and fuller for me then. But there are still documents that are redacted, um, and so and and there are still a lot of documents that are under lock and key in um, archives in Russia, and so. I think that we will continue to find out more about both Mildred and, and people in this group in, in the years ahead. Well, we're glad that you stopped writing the book at some point and went to press. Maybe yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that, that I am too. I'm I'm very glad that this this timing in particular. I feel that um, that it, I, I'm I'm glad it all came together in the way that it did. Um, and very briefly, just to answer the second part of the question, that the next book I have two books um, and can't say much about one, one is a novel um, uh, and the other, I can't say really much about either one of them. I just, I, I feel uh, that they're still in the incipient stages, but but the second one is a, a work of narrative nonfiction and it actually follows uh, a person who was, who's in my book. And I just, if I, if I, uh, more closely um, and focuses on just a six week period um, in 1945. And, and I felt um, that it was so important to, this story is so important that it deserves its own book. Let's try to squeeze in two more questions. Let's sure. see. Um, I'll speak fast. <laughs> museum is located in New York, and um, it was exciting to read about some New York connections in, in Mildred's story, including that two weeks that she stayed on St. Mark's Place when she was visiting New York. And oh, yeah. yeah. Are there other New York tidbits to Mildred's story that can help us sort of connect to at, at home to um, this heroine overseas? Oh, well, she actually lectured at NYU when she, in 1937, um, when she visited her, her family. Um, she also, she lectured at a few universities really just to make money to, to go back because she wasn't permitted to take much money at all away um, from Germany. And, 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 um, and so she had to make money while she was in the US. So she did lecture in the, at, at NYU and, and I found a, a letter that was written by one of the uh, professors uh, complimenting her, her lecture. Um, Yes, she lived uh, with her former acquaintance, um, in a former Wisconsin friend, um, uh, Clara Leiser, who wrote really gossipy letters uh, about her, <laughs> her visit, um, and, and, which is why I call her former, because uh, she really uh, was, was um, well, you'll have to read my book, but anyway, it's a, it's a moment when I'm amused at how, um, how much Clara really kind of misses Mildred and misses, misunderstands what's going on. She's one of the people who saw her as brittle and, um, and didn't understand the transformation that had happened and didn't quite piece together uh, that Mildred was in the resistance, um, you know, in a fascist dictatorship. And so, you know, her personality was not the sunny personality. She wasn't the Millie that she used to be, you know, in her college days. Um, another New York, well, Thomas Wolfe, uh, I think we've lost her again, but I know that there were some questions about where the title of the book came from. Um, uh, the title, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days, comes from the translated lines of poetry that Mildred left us in her prison cell at the end of her life. And I'm just pasting in the chat all four lines that she translated um, from which the title of the book comes. I think we'll close here, but we are so grateful to Rebecca Donner for spending this time with us today and for writing All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days the true story of the American woman at the heart of the German resistance to Hitler. You can order the book at the link in the Zoom chat from the community bookstore in Brooklyn, which is Rebecca's local bookstore, and they'll make sure that it's a signed copy. Uh, we hope you'll take the lessons of Mildred Harnock's amazing story with you as you navigate our world today, and that you will support the museum's Jewish heritage's work and join us for upcoming programs and events. You can check those out at the link in the Zoom chat. We have uh, several significant book launch programs this fall. There's a lot of really interesting, exciting new literature, uh, or nonfiction work coming out about the history and, le and legacy of the Holocaust. So uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again to Rebecca and uh, we wish everyone a great afternoon.